Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. The Arvada Center presents Legally Blonde the Musical. The strong young cast of this colorful musical is matched by the amazing designs. And later I'll meet with the costume designer and Project Runway All-Star winner, Mondo Guerra. But we begin tonight with our first visit to the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. They open the season with Twelfth Night, a co-production with the Arvada Center. We learn about the company and their full season from producing artistic director Philip C. Sneed. Well, I'm so glad that we're getting our first visit with you here at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. In four seasons, I have come here, but this is our first chance to get to interview you. Thanks for making time at the beginning of your season this year. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be on. We, we want to begin with finding out a little bit about you. How did you come to us? I know you came to us from California. Well, I actually started here because in the late 70s, I was an undergraduate student here at the University of Colorado. I was half of the first BFA class in theater. Oh, wow. And I got some of my first paychecks as an actor from the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. So I was an undergraduate student and I was working in the summer and being paid as an actor here at the Shakespeare Festival in the late 70s. So then I left in 1980 to go to California to get an MFA degree in acting in La Jolla from the University of California, mm -hmm. San Diego. And my career basically was in California and Oregon uh, for, the, for 26 years. And then I came here. When this job became available, it seemed like a wonderful opportunity to um, come back to the community I love and to an organization that had given me my start and where I had learned so much. This is a really unique um, organization, unique structure. You were telling me that you're part of the university, but yes. you're very independent. Give us sort of a, a high-level view of how that's set up. Well, we're, we're like a center or an institute, um, that the kind that exists at so many universities. And we're not the only one. There are a few dozen professional theater companies that are uh, part of a college or university. And the exact legal arrangement can vary. Um, some of them, like us, are fully integrated into the legal and administrative structure of the college. Some of them are private, standalone 501c3s mm -hmm. who simply are in residence at their host university and have a symbiotic partnership with them for mutual benefit. So uh, we're a professional theater company in residence at the university. We started um, 55 years ago. We're the second oldest Shakespeare festival in America wow. and the third oldest in North America. And uh, in the beginning, we were a product of the English department before, the, before there was a department of theater and dance. <laughs> and then when theater and dance was formed, um, we became part of them. And then over the years, we separated into a, a separate professional unit. But we have a close relationship with the academic department, and we share some resources, including facilities and some personnel. But you have to be very financially independent. Absolutely. We have to uh, bring in over a million dollars a year in ticket sales and donations and things like that. And um, um, our ticket prices are similar to the other professional theaters in the area, the Denver Center Theater Company, the Arvada Center. And uh, we hire many of the same actors that those theaters hire. So we're, we're part of that. We're, we're one of the largest and uh, biggest budget and largest audience professional theaters in the state. And our audiences, for the price they're paying, certainly expect comparable quality. Mm -hmm. So we have a very different mission from the academic department, but we like to support their mission whenever we can, and they support ours. Well, what is your mission? Well, our mission is to, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it's multifold, but basically to produce uh, classics uh, of the past and invest in classics of the future. So not only Shakespeare. Not only you Shakespeare, that's mm -hmm. right. We started out as Shakespeare only, like so many other Shakespeare theaters in America. But over the years, we've all realized that at a certain point, you really have to diversify. Shakespeare is still the heart and soul of what we do. But we look at other classics from other countries, other centuries, other cultures. And um, because Shakespeare did not work at a classics theater, Shakespeare worked at a new play theater. Yeah. We also believe, and it's in our mission and vision statement, that part of our uh, job is to try to uh, create new plays that might become part of the canon of the future. Much like in dance, ballet is the foundation of other movements. So yeah, ballet absolutely. companies do all sorts of work. A Shakespeare company, having that classical training as your foundation, can therefore do other styles. I exactly. And Shakespeare was such a, 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 a huge influence on so many writers that came afterwards. It's fun to see Shakespeare in context, I mean, to see these other plays in context with Shakespeare and try to imagine what the connections are. And classically know. trained actors doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
are all of your cast members l from Colorado or do you draw from the entire nation? You know, that's changed over the years and it's back to being almost a completely Colorado company. We probably never will be because when we hire directors, we give them uh, we try to give them their first choice of some some actors, and some of them have relationships with actors they've worked with many times that mm -hmm. happen to live somewhere else. Most of our company is from Colorado, but we usually have two or three people from, often from California or New York, but sometimes from other places as well. In a season, do you have an ensemble that we're going to see for the whole summer? Oh, absolutely. And there are five plays altogether, and you will see uh, almost every actor in the company, with very few exceptions, are in two or three plays. And in... Um, in some cases, they're playing multiple roles within a play. Mm -hmm. So they might be in three plays, but they might be playing a total of eight or ten different roles in the season. And that's part of the fun of a repertory company, is that you see an actor in one show one night and maybe playing multiple roles in that play, and then the next night or the next week, you can see them in a completely different look and style and character. I know that you're beginning your season with, uh, with a... A collaboration you started before yes. your season began with the Arvada Center with a Shakespeare production. Tell me about how your season is flowing. You know, that's very exciting to us that we were able to do this. Theaters do co-productions because it allows you to save money because you share all of the costs. And build audience. And build audience, exactly. You share all the costs of getting the play to opening night. And then each theater has their own expenses and their own revenue after that. Um, but you're right, it's an audience development tool as well. And um, the Arvada Center is such a terrific facility and um, has such a great following. We thought it was great to be able to do this. We opened there. We played it 32 performances, I believe, at the Arvada Center. When Twelfth Night opens here, um, June 9th, this is going to be uh, the most polish, polished opening night that our audiences have ever seen. I can't wait to see it. It's Noises Off next? Noises Off, yeah. Perhaps the funniest play ever written. And um, for the, the generation now that didn't see this play when it came out in the 80s or revivals in the 90s, it's going to be a fabulous discovery because uh, you just laugh so hard. I went to see it at Utah Shakespeare Festival last year when I was considering it for here. And I'd produced this play twice before. I didn't expect to find it as funny because I was so familiar with it, but I was falling out of my chair. And what else is in this season? Well, the other thing that we're doing, um, well, on the outdoor stage, Twelfth Night opens the outdoor stage, but the other two uh, plays out there are Shakespeare's tragedy, Richard the mm. Third, which is, you know, a perennial audience favorite. I mean, that character is the, the personification of Machiavellian evil. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing what he gets away with. It's a real study in evil. And then the third outdoor play is a new adaptation of the Robert Louis Stevenson novel, Treasure Island. And it's oh. an example of the kind of thing we do beside Shakespeare. It certainly could be categorized as a classic novel. And we try to do something uh, usually once a year that's for, that you might call a junior classic, that's adults will enjoy, but is, a, is really a way into classics, the idea of a large scale epic work where uh, language is important and that, that uh, deals with large themes and um, uh, just scale in every sense of the word. And Treasure Island is a perfect example of that. We've done others like The Three Musketeers and Around the World in 80 Days. So families can come at the same time you're starting to develop your audience from tomorrow. Yes, exactly. And, and it's not children's theater in that it's not one of the pl those kinds of plays that parents will dread taking their kids to <laughs> and will endure because their kids will enjoy it. It's something that, that multi-generations can enjoy together. And, and the rest of your season? The other show indoors besides Noises Off is actually a cycle of five plays and we're very excited about this. Um, it's called Women of Will, and it's put together by Tina Packer, who's uh, mm -hmm. perhaps the foremost director, actor, writer on Shakespeare in the English-speaking world. She founded um, Shakespeare and Company, not the bookstore, but the theater company in the Berkshires in 1977. And she got a Guggenheim grant to create this series of plays that use the female characters from Shakespeare combined with commentary about the plays to look at Shakespeare's take on women. Mm. And the full cycle of five plays has only been performed in Massachusetts. So this is the first time outside Massachusetts that all five plays have been performed. Tina's take on this is that Shakespeare had an unusually evolved consciousness about women and actually uh, gave women very, a very powerful voice in the plays and she charts it through the course of his career. The great thing, though, is that we know that uh, most people won't commit to five plays. So the five plays can be seen in any order, and they stand alone. You don't have to see all five of them. Well, I really thank you for taking time on, on such a busy part of your schedule to give us a little preview of what's to come. And I can't wait to come back and see the performances and learn more about the work that you're doing here at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. Thank you very much.
Next we meet two company members, Jeffrey Kent and Jamie Ann Romero. Well, we're sitting out here on the, the porch of one of the theaters that the Colorado Shakespeare Festival uses during the season. I really appreciate you sort of sneaking away before rehearsal begins. But it's not like a regular rehearsal because you've already been running for several weeks in Twelfth Night. What's it like to sort of get that advance run before you come and do it outdoors for Colorado Shakespeare Festival? Well, you know, it's really wonderful. We've never had that opportunity before. This is our um, first collaboration with Arvada that we go from Arvada to Boulder. So I think it'll be really nice and it'll be fun to take it from the Arvada stage, which seems smaller. Well, it is a smaller house, 350 or so seats to a thousand, to a thousand yeah. seat theater. It'll be great. It'll be the first time I've opened a show on the Ripon where I haven't been panicked of what my next line is. <laughs> we rehearse things pretty quickly here, and uh, it's nice to have a show kind of in the bank as it is. And it'll be a nice challenge to take it from that smaller intimate space to kind of see what things we have to do to help it play in a much larger theater. Aside from projecting for a larger house, what's the biggest difference between playing it indoors and out of doors? I think it, uh, physical life is just a little bit bigger. You just don't play it as close and intimate. Your personal bubble is bigger. Your, not overacting it, just it's it's light, slightly larger than life, just because, again, it's it's an amphitheater, so a lot of the audience can't see your face. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to tell that story through my whole body, maybe more so than I did in a smaller black box theater. Exactly, yeah. You have to give the same performance to the person in the front row as the person in the back row, so you want to make sure everyone has a good experience. Because this is a comedy, maybe it has an, an impact on the timing also, because you have to wait for the audience reaction to get back to you in a way? Well, and certainly um, going from a, a smaller theater to a larger, and we're going to a four to five times size audience, the laughs in theory uh, uh, will be longer and bigger. Um, I saw it. They'll, and, they'll yeah, be and, the, and, and, and somewhat more reliable, because in a smaller audience, you might rely on those few key laughers that release an audience, mm -hmm. whereas in a larger audience, that tends to be built into it. They tend to exist, so you can, it's a little more confident comedy out there, I think. How about a Shakespeare Festival in, in its current stage has gotten back almost to being a, a local repertory company in a way because you're in several productions most of the casts are local what does that feel like to you as an actor to know you have this as a place to be your summer home it's wonderful um, I can't imagine a better place to spend my summers than Boulder Colorado it's really really wonderful and the other thing that's also wonderful is getting to come back and work with my friends and to mm -hmm. come and play with my family and mm -hmm. it's it's a good comforting feeling to come back. And you've been on the road recently. Uh, yeah, I just got back from, uh, I did three months at the Orlando Shakespeare Theater. The, their season's opposite ours. It works wonderfully. <laughs> uh, it's called wintering. I think it's awesome. Um, but it's this is my tenth year here and it's so nice to not only have a home that's close to home um, so I can go home at the end of the day. Um, but also to work with people you know, because not only are they your friends and family, they're also, um, you get places quicker in rehearsal with people you know who can catch you when you make a big choice. And I feel really confident to take risks here because you've kind of earned the right to do that. So it's a, it's a, my favorite place to build theater. Tell me what's coming up as a, as a highlight for you in the season as an actor. What challenge are you looking forward to? Um, I'm really looking forward to doing Noises Off. Um, it's a very popular comedy, but this is my first time doing it, so I've really wanted to do it for a long time, and I'm excited. What, what's so exciting about it for you? Um, it's just so funny. I think it is so funny, and it's so quick, and it's like a very complicated choreographed dance, and you just have to get every moment right, and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and aside from the fights that we're going to get to see, what do you have to look for? What's sticking out as a personal challenge well, for you this season? For me as a choreographer, Treasure Island is epic. It's got 16 person gunfights and sword fights. It's truly a swashbuckling epic. Maybe the most Some violent. Of blockbuster yeah, of the season. <laughs> it truly is. It's the most violent play I've ever worked on at the Shakespeare Festival. Wow. It's the, the list of violence is just is five pages long of what we have to do. Um, but as an actor, noise is off just because the specificity of doing the same act of a play three different ways and remembering that. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll take a pretty couple of pretty good falls down the stairs. And uh, it's great physical comedy which asks a lot of your body and brain and I can't wait to do it. I think it's the funniest play maybe ever written. Well I can't wait to see the entire season but I'm really looking forward to also Noises Off. <laughs> um, I know you're, you need to get back into rehearsal so that you can transfer from the Arvada Center to the Amphitheater right here for the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. great to see you. 
For more information about Colorado Shakespeare Festival's full season, visit their webpage, coloradoshakes.org. This summer, the Arvada Center presents Legally Blonde the Musical as their main stage production. And the costumes are once again designed by Project Runway All-Star winner, Mondo Guerra. I think people will be surprised that your work at the Arvada Center was a little confidence boost before you went off to New York to be on Project Runway All-Stars. The first production I was here at the Arvada Center on was Evita, and they didn't have a wig person, so um, Sarah Upstad came in. She was the designer for the wigs, but they didn't have a maintenance, so I learned wigs probably in the first week that I was here. Plus I was doing patterning, plus I was really kind of honing my skills in stitching and then learning crafting and so I, this was really like a master class of how how it gets done and at a fast pace so I know that really applies to the speed that you really need to have to be competitive on Project Runway you yeah. know or in fashion at all in fashion at all you know like and even when I you know when I design shows here I've realized that it is just almost like a runway you know work's not done until they step on stage for the opening night. And even then I can tell you're sitting in your seat going, I want to like, I want to tweak that a little bit, you yep. know, so I mean, but it's enjoyable. Um, and uh, and the girls in the shop right now are just so good. They've gotten so much done. This is a huge show. I thought Harrisbury was big, but this one is deceivingly huge. I think there's close to 250 plus looks. Oh my goodness. In total. You know, and it's a modern show, so that's a you know that's different from for me because I really like kind of doing period, and I'm not talking like corsets and that, but like 50s, 60s, 70s. Like I really kind of um, look for look to that for inspiration in my own work, so that's really kind of easy for me. But this is a modern show, so they have to be hip and they have to be cool. Plus, we have um, the idea of UCLA and. Harvard, so mm -hmm. they're t completely different. You know, they're like um, Forever 21 and Abercrombie and Fitch. So we've been doing a lot of shopping for the show, but yeah, it was very specific to make for 14 looks for Elle from head to toe. We built them in shop because- All of her outfits yeah. have to be iconic yes. looks for and, her, because that's it, her, who she exactly. is. Exactly, and I, you know, I, want, I didn't want the audience to recognize anything off the shelf mm -hmm. that she's wearing, because I don't, she's kind of like my fantasy, you know, like she has to be the fashion trendsetter. Um, so I, you don't see her as a fashion victim, you see her as someone who knows fashion. Somebody that's confident, you know, she might not, I mean, Listen, we all make mistakes <laughs> when we get dressed sometimes, you know, like... Shh, don't it's, tell anybody. You know, that's the best thing about it. I mean, fashion should be fun. And I think Al has this personality that really takes the opportunity to um, experiment with her mm -hmm. clothes, you know. So she's pulling from, you know, things that she knows. So she knows the 90s and she knows, you know, um, 2000 and through um, current times. So she's really, you know, just having fun with her clothes. And, you know... I. In my head, I always kind of create these characters for um, the people that I'm designing for. So she's just kind of a girl that is, she might be a little naive, but she's not really letting people know that. She's really confident on the outside. Mm -hmm. And in some way, she doesn't really uh, let anybody bring her down. And she doesn't know that. She doesn't really know that people are actually kind of intimidated by her. And that's why they kind of judge her. Do you think people are intimidated by you? Um, I guess I do kind of relate to the character a little bit. I think there are some things that people don't understand about me that um, I don't really have to speak about because as long as I'm happy and creating things that I want to do, then there's no reason for me to uh, make excuses or mm -hmm. say sorry. I think most people um, who love you mm -hmm. and love your work do see you as that positive very open and loving source of energy. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this show is about, it, ultimately. Right, you know, it, it, Al definitely takes a journey. She uh, She's dumped at the very beginning by somebody that she's madly in love with, and she's, you know, trying to make up for it, so she goes to Harvard, and just for this guy, and then she realizes that she has something more um, to share and she wants to learn and she's so passionate. She finds this new career to be 
she finds herself so passionate about this new career and this new venture, and she finds out that she's really good. And you know that like kind of innocence really applies to what she what she's doing because she's very honest, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, She's not necessarily a lawyer, she's a friend, and I think that's why she's so successful because she, she can um, earn people's trust. I can tell it wasn't a great leap for you to identify with mm -hmm. the main character of the story. She was, you know, I, I, I've, well, here's the thing. I w when I watched the movie in 2000, I had just broken my ankle in New York, <laughs> and so I was laid up for about three days, and I had just rented the movie, uh, before I broke my ankle, so I watched it over and over and over and over and over again. And um, so when I got the opportunity to design for the show, I definitely said yes. I think, you know, Rudd and I had been planning for me to be on this show as the costume designer since Hairspray because yep. I knew it was coming up and I was so excited because this is completely different from Hairspray. And I will say that it was a little scary because in Hairspray, there's those moments that people know, like it's such an iconic kind of show, Hairspray where, you know, Edna and Tracy come out and they're like crazy uh, little shift dresses with all the sequins. And at the end where Edna comes out of the hairspray can, it's a big moment. And I kept on, you know, the hard part with this show with Legally Blonde was I didn't know where I was going to have that opportunity to really give that impact, mm -hmm. to really have those moments where people are like, <gasps> like excited to see her come out. And, but you know, since I've been sitting in the previews, there are definitely moments where, you know, um, certain characters walk in and they're just like, you know, like they shake their head in disbelief <laughs> or they gasp or they laugh. And that's the, that's the best feeling as a costume designer is because, because um, they're really responding to something kind of unexpected. In Hairspray, you mentioned that some of your influences that you were drawing from, mm -hmm. some of the vernacular was Paco Rabanne and mm -hmm. things for the, what did you draw from beside the movie for Legally Blonde? Well, I watched the stage production as well. Um, there are certain looks that you can definitely see this really, really um, successful marriage of the movie and the stage production. Um, I always felt like Al was really, really related to my sister. My sister's kind of mm -hmm. that girl. She's always kind of really positive and really cute and super nice to everybody. I pulled from her. Oh, and if you saw my drawings, they have these cute little bodies and these really oversized heads. And I thought, like you Brad's know. Like <laughs> No, like Brad Stalls. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to tell you. The inspiration came from Brad Stalls because they're so, because Al's like a little doll. Uh -huh. She's like a little doll. And if you know, Haley that plays Elle, she's, she is a doll. And it's just been so much fun to, uh, to work with her. And as an actor, I'm so impressed with how aware she is, not only about how she looks and how she has to adjust her stuff, because she has changes after changes after changes after Some changes. of them are on stage. Some of them are on stage, <laughs> you know, and just, she just knows like her surroundings so well. And, it, and I've never worked with an actor like this that really knows how to interpret the costume. Oh, that's a high compliment. Yeah. Now I know it's opening night tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to come back and see the, the whole thing uh -huh. fleshed out, but it would, it would be a wasted opportunity not to ask you about how is it going at Marie Claire and September mm -hmm. when your line comes out. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, things are going really well. Um, we're trying to make, again, the most impact with all the different um, opportunities that were given to me from All Stars. So we might see some um, more <laughs> some more <laughs> on air opportunities coming from the hmm. whole, <laughs> the whole crazy life of uh, Mondo Guerra that has happened now. So what is it like at the magazine for you? Are, are you are you still going back and forth to be able to yeah, do Yeah, I'm community I'm commuting all the time, mostly for Ken Downing from um, from Neiman Marcus just because they're based out of Dallas and they're based out of New York and so wherever they are I have to travel to them because it's you know how it is like if I wasn't living in New York it'd be so much more easy um, but I've been traveling so much in the past year that I haven't really been able to nail down the plan to actually move so, so Colorado is still home for the time being. yes Colorado is still home and I love it here especially during the summer and you know if I wasn't here I wouldn't be able to design the show here so well, I That's hope good. that you get to continue your relationship with the Arvada Center because even after seeing your Godspell costume, mm -hmm. that winning costume, mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I, I think that you're one of those designers who costume design will always be part of your vernacular. Right. Well, I will say you know, the, a couple of things. Um, so this, this show was really tough for me because I have been so absent from the process just because I've been traveling so much. And um, when I saw the preview on Sunday, I turned to my um, costume design assistant, Meredith Murphy, here at the Arvada Center and said, I love doing this. And I was like, I would do this again in a heartbeat. And she was like, what are you talking about? I was like, yes, I would totally do it. And then another thing is uh, one of the other Project Runway alumni, Emilio Sosa, was just nominated for a Tony for his work, for his costume designs on Porgy and Bess. And so now I'm such a competitive person. I'm like, now that's a new the goal. The Denver Post Ovation Award isn't enough. Now you want a Tony. Well, I want a Tony. Come on now. I'm, I mean, so yeah, that's a new goal. You know, it's like, Emilio, you can do it. I can do it too. You know, that's just how I work. That's how I've gotten through life. It's like if I see somebody that I admire and somebody that I um, look up to achieve something and know that they can accomplish it, I feel like I c can also have that opportunity. So it's a new goal. I think watching you does that for others here in Colorado, seeing what you're able to do, whether they're in fashion or any other creative mm -hmm. endeavor, you're inspiring them to reach out for well, those you. opportunities also. I appreciate you taking time on opening night to talk to me. When you come back, we have to talk about your line for Neiman Marcus, okay, a little bit more about Mary Claire. All right. Good luck tonight. Thank you so much, Eden. Oh my God, you guys. Legally Blonde only lasts at the Arvada Center through July 1st. Visit arvadacenter.org for more information. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night.